I have been using several products from Hardened Soil for the past eight months, and the benefits have been amazing. I'm 70 years old, and I feel as though I have had a reset in my overall health. It's as if my age clock has rolled back 15 years. I feel better, have so much more energy, and my body movement, my joints feel and move so much better. It really has been more than I ever expected. My brain clarity has been much improved as well. My family has noticed the difference. My daughters have said they think I'm getting younger instead of older. And I certainly feel that way. Hope I never have to stop taking this product. I feel like it really has been a godsend to me. Thank you for heart and soil. I'm a believer. That's from Shannon, who's taking our lifeblood and uh, beef organs products. And I'm so stoked to share those type of reviews with you guys because they make me feel good. They warm the cockles of my heart. That's an expression that my great grandmother used to say. My mom always used to share it with me. They make me feel really good about the work that we're doing at Heart and Soil. If you guys don't know about us, we are making grass-fed, grass-finished, regeneratively raised, desiccated, that is freeze-dried to preserve as many nutrients as possible, organ supplements in a capsule. You guys have heard me talk about the benefits of liver, organ, testicle, spleen, pancreas, kidney, brain, but those are hard to get. Not a lot of us want to cook them. They're hard to travel with. And I want these to be available to everyone, including my mom and my dad and my niece and my nephew and all the people in my family and everyone in your family. And so that's why I built Heart and Soil. You can check us out at heartandsoil.co, that's .co. And our mission is to help you reclaim your birthright to radical health like Shannon is and get more organs in your diet. Getting more organs in your diet, I think will be a huge portion of that. So check us out, heartandsoil.co, and reclaim your birthright to radical health. My guest on this week's podcast is none other than the inimitable Dave Feldman. David Feldman, I think he goes by Dave. I'm just kidding. He always goes by Dave. He's been on the podcast probably no less than four times at this point, and we go deep into lipids. One of the questions I get asked all the time is, Paul, what about my cholesterol? My cholesterol went up on this diet. Is this a problem? to which I always sort of try and send links to my previous podcast with Dave. I've also done podcasts with Ivor Cummins on this topic, as well as Malcolm Kendrick, just about uh, many people in the space. I'd love to do more debates with people uh, in the space as well about lipids. But this is a really interesting, updated, wide-ranging conversation on lipids in the human diet, um, why familial hypercholesterolemia is not a good proxy for elevated LDL, how to think about your elevated LDL, other blood work to think about, um, how to know if you're metabolically healthy, how to know if your lipids are a concern, what sort of testing you can do, and an amazing study that Dave has now begun. You can support his work at citizensciencefoundation.org. He's doing an incredible uh, parallel design, I believe, uh, or he's doing, maybe not, it's a prospective study, but it is interventional, and they're looking at actual calcification in the arteries of people's hearts who are on ketogenic diets and low carb diets that are hyper responders, that is have elevated LDL with um, low triglycerides and high HDL, something I've talked about all the time. And we can't wait for the results of this study. But here, Dave and I talk about all these things, answer all of your questions about cholesterol. This is a good one. Send it to anyone you know who is worried about their cholesterol when they eat more meat, because sometimes LDL does go up. And this is the podcast for them. I hope this podcast brings a higher quality of life to all of your lives. I feel very fortunate and grateful and privileged to be able to provide it as a free resource. All right, guys, on to the podcast with David Feldman, my buddy, Dave Feldman. Uh, I love talking about lipids. This was no exception. Enjoy. Dave Feldman, thanks for coming back on the podcast, my friend. It's good to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Paul. How are you? I'm doing great. So if people don't know, Dave has been on the podcast at least three times. This may be his fourth. We will link to all of the previous episodes in the show notes. And I think that about every year or so, Dave, um, as I told you, it's important to have another conversation about cholesterol because there's people that are listening to this podcast now that have found me through different avenues who are new. And I, I still constantly get questions. I get people who are emailing me and they say, I feel amazing on an animal-based diet. And I go to my doctor and my LDL is higher than usual. Some people say sky high, some people say higher than usual, it's all relative. And they say, what should I do about this? And I think, okay, um, it's time to get Dave back on the podcast. Uh, we've talked about this in the past, but I'll let you, I'll let you start from there. So uh, hopefully that, 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 that 
is a good segue, a good, a good softball for you as we start. But it's, you know, you can imagine here's somebody who is changing their diet to include more saturated fat, less seed oils, uh, more meat, more organs, maybe some fruit, maybe some honey. So they're eating carbohydrates or sometimes people are doing carnivores. They're in ketosis. And you've heard this before, invariably, well, not invariably, let's be honest, but the majority of the time, the vast majority, they feel really good and their LDL goes up. So where do we go from there? Well, yeah. So let's, let's start with kind of, you know, we talked about this a little bit offline, but I kind of want to take a big step back because I think what happens is for five, six long years, as I pursued this, there's one part of this that I've always thought was fairly self-evident. And so in doing so, I would chat about it with the expectation that the, you know, the audience, especially if they were like higher level researchers and lipidologists and so forth would get that part. And then I could move on to the remaining parts, but I was wrong about that because there is actually something that I've underestimated for a long time that I'm going to quit underestimating, which is our desire. We have an innate desire just as humans for something to be a simple problem and therefore it having a simple solution. And that's, that's important to recognize early on, because when I tell you about why LDL might be higher, going especially very low carb and being powered much more by fat, it's important that you see it in this like larger context of metabolism. So let's take the real big step back, talk about metabolism 101 on what, it, what, what we really mean, because people hear it all the time, right? What we're talking about is this counterbalance between anabolism Anabolism is the building up of stuff, right? And catabolism, which is the breaking down of stuff. And when we're talking about the metabolism, we're talking about meta metabolism. It's the constant counterbalancing between these two. So the most common way in which we're describing it, particularly in the human body, is with regard to fuel. So if you are fueled predominantly by, let's start with glu glucose, so predominantly by carbohydrates, then the fuel supply you're building up is the form of stored glucose, which is glycogen, right? So you're building it up. And then when you're done eating, you're breaking it down over time and you're being fueled by it in large part, if that's a predominant part of your diet. Conversely, if you're fueled by fat, you're having to build up via anabolism. You're building up your fat stores. And then between meals and while you're sleeping, you're breaking it down. Now, you already know the answer to this question. Can you move that fat around in your body without things that carry it in the bloodstream? And the obvious answer emphatically is no, you cannot. You need carrier proteins that your body makes. The protein a lot of people don't know about is called albumin that carries free fatty acids, but the protein you hear plenty about is ApoB, ApoB containing lipoprotein. So you need those carriers. Well, so I want you to hold in your head, metabolism. metabolism. Metabolism is that success of breaking down and building up those fats. So when I do experiments where I change my lipid levels, I know you're very familiar with a lot of these, I change all of them, all of my lipid levels. Paul, would you, would you make a bet with me right now, let's say for $1,000, that you could pick a number between say 75 and 350, and in seven days, I would like to bet you that I could move the cholesterol levels in my blood to within 30 milligrams per deciliter of that number. Would you take me up on that bet? Well, I know enough about your experiments in the past that I wouldn't wager $1,000 that you would not be able to do that. R right, right. So, so yes, because you know about those experiments, you know that I've not only demonstrated this, I've actually demonstrated this several times over. I clearly have manipulated levels of, again, all of my lipids. HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, total cholesterol, triglycerides, but on top of that, enzymes related to them, like LPPLA2 and so forth. Okay, so now that you have that context together, is it at all possible that any of the lipid levels I just mentioned could be impacted by dysfunction in metabolism? That there's a problem in the way that there's the anabolism and catabolism balancing and I would posit that, of course, of course, there should be consideration at a minimum that the problems with metabolism could in some way relate to changes in these lipid profiles. And how much do we find those 
altered lipid profiles associate with disease, particularly the buildup of plaque in the arteries known as atherosclerosis? That's a relevant question. And, and so I know I kind of took some time to really drill down into that, but that's the, that's the starting point. I have to get better at getting everyone to uh, start with is that the experiments that I've done and that we've seen going on in the low carb community that change these lipid levels, particularly when they seem to line up with each other, right? When we're talking about the triad, we're seeing so many people go low carb, see that their LDL rises alongside their HDL going up and their triglycerides going down with the latter two typically being associated with better, healthier metabolism. Is that relevant when comparing that lipid profile to profiles that are typical of poor metabolism, particularly lipid metabolism? And my answer to that question is yes. It's, I, I think that once you can recognize that there's a dysfunction in lipid metabolism, we have to, usually all of us, we have to recognize that we have to take that into account when starting to look at what the levels of any particular lipid number, especially LDL, have in its association with atherosclerosis. Does, do you follow me so far? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so I think, yeah, yeah go ahead. No, I, I, so, so now that I've led to that bridge, let's cross that bridge together and let's acknowledge something kind of important, which is that generally speaking, with poor lipid regulation in a mixed diet context, you tend to see HDL goes down, triglycerides go up, and LDL tends to go up marginally. And small LDL particles tend to go up a lot. But on top of that, you tend to see more triglycerides on board these carrier proteins relative to that first context, relative to the healthy context. So the major difference here is now if we get out of the mixed diet context, and we're looking at people who are specifically fat adapted, now you've got to take into, to, uh, take into consideration those two major things I just mentioned. The first one was whether or not metabolism requires carrier proteins in order to move around fat. They do, yes, we agree. Okay, then if you also agree that dysfunction in the lipid metabolism could have an impact on these lipid levels as well, then you basically have all of the components you need to to understand why I could feel cautiously optimistic with high LDL in this context, in the healthy lipid metabolism context. That point cannot be overstated. So allow me to reiterate it for those listening and maybe give a little bit more framing. What we are discussing here are two independent situations of, quote, LDL, low-density lipoprotein, that is above, quote, the normal which for most people, the normal range on a lab panel would be 130 milligrams per deciliter, which is a essentially a volumetric density measure, milligrams of weight per a volume, uh, as opposed to a particle count, which is going to be in nanomole per liter. But we're, the, the, the crux of this discussion is around the LDL particle. And what Dave is beginning to describe here are two disparate contexts, or we are making the case that these are independent situations. LDL, low-density lipoprotein, as Dave states, a carrier molecule, a lipoprotein, essentially a sphere which contains within it cholesterol and triglycerides and has within its membrane identifying proteins such as ApoB100 or others, many, many, many apolipoproteins in the LDL uh, membrane. But that, that molecule, which is moving cholesterol and triglycerides around our body because they are not soluble in blood without a carrier protein, as Dave notes, is, is that molecule going to cause atherosclerosis? And could that molecule be an indicator of issues or a propensity for atherosclerosis differently depending on your metabolic context? That's the way I see it. And context is the most important word that often gets ignored by physicians. And you can see the context based on the other lipoproteins that Dave has already mentioned, specifically triglycerides and HDL, high-density lipoprotein, which is another spherical or disc-shaped uh, molecule that is a carrier protein, depending how, how full of uh, lipids it is within it. Um, and triglycerides are a molecule that is carried within both of these sort of buses around the body. But the question becomes, is, is LDL a risk factor for heart disease, atherosclerosis, those are synonyms, differently depending on your metabolic health, depending on the metabolic context. 
And that is the question that we are asking, that Dave has been asking, that I've continually tried to help people understand, that um, that it, you must look at things. Dave said the word triad, which is a term that, that he's coined, which is, for those who don't know, when Dave says triad, he means someone that has a, a quote-unquote elevated LDL with uh, robust or high HDL and low triglycerides. And the triad is indicative of an underlying metabolic health. And I would say almost always is going to associate with a low fasting insulin and other metrics that give us a sense of quote unquote insulin sensitivity. So with that framing, I'll, I'll throw it back over to you, Dave. Hopefully I didn't obfuscate it more. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit more background for people there. No, and I, I love, because now we can get a little bit geekier, right? But while we're still kind of in that middle zone, it's worth pointing out that I do believe that ApoB containing lipoproteins, is, including LDL, are part of the causal chain of atherosclerosis. But there's an important distinction I'm making here, which I'm sure you're picking up on, which is it's kind of it's sort of like saying, is the number of trips you're making to the hospital associative to your health? Well, yes, probably. The number of trips that you're making in your car, does that mean your car is causing your bad health? Well, no, this obviously is very context-driven. It has to do the reason for why you're going to the hospital so often in your car may have to do with the disease. And it's really the disease that's driving, excuse the pun, that's driving the degree with which you're using your car to make use of it to go to the hospital. Can your car also be made use of to go to uh, get groceries? Yes. In fact, that might be the primary purpose for your car, that usually when you're using your car, to do one of these two activities, it's, to, it's typically to get groceries, right? So likewise, can I make the same claim about lipoproteins, particularly ApoB-containing lipoproteins? I definitely can, and the literature backs this up. ApoB-containing lipoproteins are typically, they're typically, you mentioned ApoB-100, that comes from the liver. It starts, it starts bloated with triglycerides, the stored form of fatty acids. And it's part of the lipid energy model that we're working on that indeed, that's a lot of the reason we think that you're seeing higher LDL is that these bloated VLDL, these VLDL that start with lots of triglycerides are distributing those triglycerides to various tissues, particularly your adipocytes, because your adipocytes provide local fatty acids to nearby tissues. They're, they're leaving the liver with a lot of these. And then as they get depleted, they become LDL. And, and both of these are ApoB-containing lipoproteins. So that's the energy delivery side of the ledger. But do ApoB-containing lipoproteins, are they involved in the immune response as well? Are they involved in something beyond more than energy delivery? And the answer to that is emphatic yes. They are what we would call acute phase reactants. Acute phase reactants, plainly stated, are proteins that rise 25% or greater in the bloodstream. In, in an immune response. And that's extremely relevant because you do find that there are a number of things that can activate a higher degree of secretion of ApoB, such as uh, cytokines. Cytokines release, uh, including adipokines, which are, um, sorry, these are signaling molecules. And they can signal a certain uh, threshold to the liver for there to be a, a more rapid release of these ApoB-containing lipoproteins, which makes sense because we know a number of ways in which they engage in the immune response. Uh, ApoBs can, um, lipoproteins can bind to pathogens. Um, they also, um, and, and something that you know I brought up many times before when chatting about this with you, I'm especially interested in how they can be part of the host defense for uh, uh, oxidative stress. They can, I know that it's constantly discussed as though uh, oxidized LDL particles are terrible and that it's a good reason to bring down LDL because they have the risk of becoming oxidized. But I would posit, or at least to put on the table, is it also just as possible that you could think of them as non-nucleated immune cells and that it's really part of their job to get oxidized since we have existing receptors in immune cells in, and including endothelial cells whose job it is to bind to modified LDL particles to remove them from circulation, hopefully get them into lysosomes where they can be destroyed as opposed to, as opposed to if, the, if um, uh, these reactive oxygen species at a certain threshold you know, create chain oxidative events on things other than lipoproteins. I, my, my favorite analogy to date, it's still my favorite analogy, is think of the bumper on your car. You, you don't want to smash up the bumper on your car, but 
You'd rather smash up the bumper on your car than you would your engine, which is why you have a bumper on your car. I want to understand how much lipoproteins, especially ApoB-containing lipoproteins, can function in that regard, just as we see with macrophages. And I think that your point here is, is a really good next point to emphasize. Just because ApoB lipoprotein, containing lipoproteins, of which LDL is one, chylomicrons, et cetera, or others, are clearly involved in the process of plaque formation in the arterial wall, does that mean that they are the initiators of that plaque formation in the arterial wall? And that is the point that I have and you have um, been most uh, questioning of in the past. There are good studies in mouse and rat models suggesting that ApoB knockout models of these animals do not develop um, do not develop atherosclerosis. We know that if we get rid of ApoB 100, at least in mice and rats, they do not develop atherosclerosis. My concern, personally, and I believe that you may share this concern, is that within the medical community, this type of evidence is being conflated with the notion that because ApoB lipoprotein, containing lipoproteins are clearly involved in the progression, many believe that they are causal. And to me, that would mean a clear proof of direct endothelial, which is the lining of blood vessels, a direct endothelial damage of LDL. Because the ultimate equation that we're working with here, and correct me if you think any of this, if you think about any of this differently, is LDL, the mainstream the mainstream model, essentially the, um, the, the model of atherosclerosis that is promulgated by mainstream Western medicine and cardiology in general, is LDL is causal of atherosclerosis. The ApoB-containing particle is directly injurious to the endothelium. Therefore, anything that raises your LDL, regardless of your underlying metabolic health, is a problem. And to me, and I believe to you, that is an equation that is incomplete. It, yes, de definitely. Well, first of all, I honestly, the physics have never worked out for me on this. If you if you come to understand what ApoB containing lipoproteins are, especially LDL, they are, uh, and, and I may have to double check my figures on this, but I'm pretty sure that they're roughly around 22.5 nanometers. Uh, you find out that the endothelial cell bilayer is around five to 10 nanometers, just itself, just the bilayer. And it's made of uh, um, cross uh, uh, phospholipids. And that's, that's maybe at its weakest point. It's otherwise covered with all kinds of proteins as well. But on top of that, it's, it's further covered by the glycocalyx, right? Um, okay. So you, you'd have to believe that these ApoB containing lipoproteins can penetrate the glycocalyx, the bilayer, actually go all the way through the cytosol, the uh, cytoskeleton, all of the organelles and so forth without, without likewise damaging them in a corresponding way to then smash through the other side of the other bilayer and then into the subendothelial space. Um, that again, the, the physics, it just never connected for me. Now, you could make the argument they're getting through the junction gaps and that's, that's a commonly made statement as well. However, if you look into the science on that too, it's also extraordinarily narrow and like, I think it's something in the neighborhood between five and 10 nanometers itself. And it's, it's kind of like a zipper. It's, it has lots of different cross uh, proteins to allow for transmigration and so forth. Now, important to note though, I can tell you when that gap opens and it opens with inflammation. It's actually the 101 book for when endothelial cells intentionally separate from each other. And it's, and it's so as to make it porous and allow for monocytes to differentiate into macrophages where they can then get into the subendothelial space and take care of whatever debris or pathogens or so on and so forth that are in there. So bringing it back to your, your major point, it would likewise be accurate to say that macrophages are part of the causal pathway for atherosclerosis. So for sure, if you limited the production of these immune cells like macrophages, you would almost certainly get less atherosclerosis. But that would mean impairing the immune response. And what I'm curious about is how much we can likewise uh, check this against impairing lipoprotein uh, production and availability, right? So this is why I always come back to the same thing over and over again. I'm sure you are tired of hearing me say this by now, but maybe other people aren't, which is why I always come back to all-cause mortality, the ultimate balance sheet, because 
it's not just the two things I mentioned. There are other things like scavenger receptors. You can impair scavenger receptors. So there's knockout mice that have less scavenger receptors. They have less atherosclerosis, but do they live longer? Is impairing your immune response making a terrible trade-off on the other side? Where yes, you have less atherosclerosis, but maybe you have uh, more infections. Maybe you have more cancer. All of these things, all the non-cardiovascular disease factors, I want to see accounted for. I don't want to see a study that's looking only at one endpoint, even in, even in animal models. I would like it if I could see how much it applies to the entire balance. Exactly. And as you pointed out in human trials, that all-cause mortality is very important to look at as well. So just so people understand what we're talking about here, we're talking about events that are occurring within the vessel wall in arteries because veins do not develop atherosclerosis. Um, but within arteries, a higher pressure system, which probably leads to more damage of the endothelium. If you are within the artery, if you are Rick Moranis in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and you're flying around the artery in your little spaceship, and you're looking at the artery wall, you're seeing the single cell layer of endothelial cells. Now, interestingly, endothelium, this, this type of histology occurs many places in the human body. It occurs within your gut as well. There's a single cell layer of endothelium in the small intestine. And so the pathologies are very similar. And there's a single cell layer of endothelium at the blood-brain barrier between the dura and the blood and the CSF. And so this single cell layer occurs throughout the body. But right now we're talking about it within an artery. And what Dave is describing is the way that these endothelial cells are stitched together, how, how large the holes between them, the fenestrations are between them, and when those fenestrations may open or close, and the improbability of something like a um, the improbability of something like a an LDL particle moving across multiple lipid bilayers into a subendothelial space, which we call the intima. So, if you look at the, the vessel sideways, it's called the intima, um, and you can see that below the endothelium is the intimal space, which is where macrophages tend to engulf LDL particles that's felt to be canonically the beginning of an atherosclerotic plaque. And so what Dave is describing is these endothelial cells can sometimes separate to allow monocytes, which are macrophage precursors, to move into that space to do some immunologic, essentially cleanup at, at times. So we have this sort of pathology. We have this, or we have this, hey, this Jeff, paradigm. Can I, just, can I just add? And that's, that's crucial because that is a scenario where I would expect ApoB-containing lipoproteins or really many different elements of the bloodstream to potentially penetrate because it, it, this is quite literally that, that uh, swelling that you see as part of uh, inflammation is a lot of that separation and a lot of the pooling of the blood there. So the, the larger question that, that you're brushing past that I love is the one I keep asking everybody, which is, have we ever been able to observe atherosclerosis development absent an inflammatory response or a site of inflammation that we can confirm was in fact a healthy endothelium with otherwise absolutely functioning aspects to it, right? And, and as of yet, and I'm telling you in six years, this is something I quite directly ask immunologists, I ask lipidologists, I ask cardiologists. Have we ever, have we ever been able to develop an animal model? for which we can just increase that concentrative level of uh, lipoproteins in the bloodstream without any genetic abnormalities and with a healthy vascular system. And to the best of my knowledge, this has never been accomplished. And even with something like apheresis or anything along those lines, there usually has to be some kind of other abnormality that's introduced. So that's, that's, that's crucial. It's so crucial because I absolutely do think you can get lipoproteins into the subintimal uh, intimal space and for there to be a process of atherosclerosis, particularly where they induce it through injury, such as through uh, denuding with a, uh, a balloon catheter, something like that, which is an experiment that they'll do with like the carotid arteries in order to create atherosclerosis and then study its progression and so forth. So we already know injury does accomplish this. We've not yet observed a healthy vasculature without injury um, through a model for which we can tightly control and confirm this to be the case. That's all. Are you aware also of any experiments that are able to demonstrate that LDL or ApoB containing lipoproteins are directly injurious to the endothelium? 
are harmful to humans. And these are particles that, as you astutely point out, have other indispensable roles in the immune system. I think this LDL gets a bad rap. It's just, it's painted as this villain. It's painted as this arsonist starting fires when in fact it's probably the fireman, as we both know. But are you aware of any experiments showing that ApoB containing lipoproteins are directly injurious to the endothelium in an otherwise metabolically healthy individual? It, it qualified no. I say qualified because I want to, I want to be a good scientist and recognize that that is hard for researchers to accomplish making happen, particularly for humans, because that would be considered unethical. But it is something that, as I understood, as I understand, can happen with animals. And I've heard somewhat secondhand that it has been attempted in multiple ways, but it, was, it wasn't until they did things like introduce other lipoproteins of other species, including humans, like adding human lipoproteins to um, you know, rodent models. So again, I'm trying to be devil's advocate at the same time. What um, what researchers would tell me was the problem is because rodents have a very different lipid system than we do. They don't tend to have as many LDL as we do. It's a little it's a little bit harder to create a likewise model. And but that said, I challenge these same researchers: Why are you using human ApoB containing lipoproteins? Then why not use the same you know at least rodent uh, ApoB containing lipoproteins? Even if it's more expensive, it would be more compelling data if we knew that they were native, right? Uh, even though there is still risk that you can actually oxidize them in the apheresis process, which is, you know, problematic in itself. And this, this, if you don't mind, kind of gets me full circle to, uh, if you don't mind my mentioning the study, um, this, this, do. this is why four years ago, when identifying the lean mass hyperresponder phenotype, which hopefully your listeners know, but for anybody who doesn't, it's the triad, those three that we talked about earlier, but at a more extreme level. So people who typically have an LDL of 200 or higher, uh, typically have an HDL of 80 or higher and triglycerides of 70 or lower. And all three of those together, all three of those are already rare individually by themselves. But these three together are actually very prominent in the low carb community where people are otherwise lean and metabolically healthy. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Paul, you've spent a, a decent amount of time in that phenotype yourself. Um, uh -huh. when you first went carnivore, right? Well, I think that I still display that phenotype. And for those who are not familiar with that word phenotype, it's just a physical manifestation of, of a physiologic condition. So when Dave says lean mass hyperresponder phenotype, he's just saying this is the way someone looks physiologically if you look at their lipids. Um, I checked my lipids with a home device in honor of this podcast. Uh, my triglycerides were uh, 74, my HDO was 87, and my LDO was 216 milligrams per deciliter. Um, that's basically where I've lived for the last few years. I have had an LDL that has been higher uh, in the past when I was keto. I'm no longer keto. And maybe at the end of the podcast, we can talk about some of these other issues because I think that um, there's an interesting conversation around uh, ketogenic and low-carb diets raising LDL. I, I see it as two questions here. One question is why does LDL uh, increase? And the other question, which is which I'm more interested in is, is, is LDL directly injurious to the endothelium? Is LDL the proximate cause of atherosclerosis? Because even when I'm not on a ketogenic diet, my LDL is almost always above 200. Right, um, right. Yeah. And, and, this, and this brings it, you're exactly right. It's, I quite literally phrase it as, those are the two questions I'm most interested in. One is the lipid energy model, which as you know, is uh, my attempt. And now I have some uh, great partners in uh, Nick Norwitz and Adrian Soto. They're uh, helping us put together the lipid energy model paper uh, that seeks to help explain uh, in large part why we think we see this. And for that matter, why we would see it in you right now, which is that we believe that you're, if you, even when you have more carbs in your diet, if you're still trafficking a lot of fat-based energy, it makes sense why there would be downstream resulting higher levels of lipoprotein particles, ApoB-containing lipoproteins that are depleted of their triglycerides have cholesterol and therefore you see the higher levels of LDL, unless of course you're much more on a carb centric diet, unless your metabolism is much more reliant on glucose and glycogen and therefore trafficking less of ABOB. But yes, the second question is one that like I, I say this kind of jokingly, but not jokingly, which is that if, as much as I'm interested in the lipid energy model, if I were to assign points, I would give it one point. Whereas whether or not, it is actually atherogenic, I would assign a million points, right? We're so much more interested in whether or not 
people who see these enormous gains, who are, feel like they're thriving on a very low carb diet, but there's just this one thing that's just a bright spotlight, if that truly is pathogenic. And, you know, again, I want to be a good scientist. I don't know the answer to that. Even if a lot of what I'm seeing right now feels somewhat encouraging, we need stronger data. And so four years ago, as I identified this, I, I started knocking on the doors of lipidologists and cardiologists. And I said, we should get this phenotype into a study. We should, we should look at them. And about two years, literally two years ago this month, October of 2019, after two years of trying to raise the money privately, trying to get researchers interested, I kind of just gave up and said, you know what, I'm just going to go on a Houston stage at Low Carb Houston and try to crowdfund it, which in retrospect seems so incredibly crazy to just like go to the community and be like, could you guys give me a couple hundred thousand dollars to do this study? And, uh, and Paul, the community stepped up like that's, we have a quarter of a million dollar study. And for what it's worth, that's after I talked them down in price because the center that's doing it would have charged way more than that. Um, but to my, to my great appreciation, they're doing it for us. And, and here's the gist of the study. We have a hundred of these people, or at least that's our recruitment goal to get a hundred lean mass hyper slightly more relaxed cut points. So if you're somebody who's listening and you fit these cut points, please check out citizenscienceFoundation.org. You'll, you'll find the criteria there. But basically, uh, if after having gone on the diet, your LDL is 190 and your HDL is 60, or higher, sorry, LDL of 190 or higher, HDL of 60 or higher, and triglycerides of 80 or lower. And before having started the diet, your LDL was lower than that. It was like 160 or lower. And that's the major criteria. So people who we know had a hyper response and saw those LDL levels change. And then just the one last piece is it had to have changed more than 50%. Your LDL had to have gone 50% or higher relative to how it was before you started this diet. And then that, that gives us the hyper response we're looking for. And we want to then take a scan of everybody. We're flying everyone to UCLA, to the Lundquist Institute, where they will take a CT angiogram of their cardiovascular system. They then head home and a year later, they come back, we do another scan, and then we can do a comparison data analysis against both of those scans. And I'm already on record for again, saying I'm cautiously optimistic. I think at a population level, we will see a low uh, to very low progression of atherosclerosis. Whereas the existing expectation is that they will show what would, what would be seen in populations with heterozygous FH or homozygous FH, uh, FH being familial hypercholesterolemia, and that there should be a rapid progression of atherosclerosis. Again, you know this from having done the research on this. The lipid hypothesis is quite clear. It's those response, it's dose dependent. The higher the concentration, the more atherosclerosis. And so with high resolution CT imaging, we should absolutely be able to identify existing plaques and observe the volume change. And we have one of the best uh, CT imaging experts is our principal investigator in um, uh, Dr. Matt Budoff. He's had, he's had over 1200 papers to his name. I don't think I've met anybody who's even had over 600 papers before him. Um, it's crazy. Oh, but, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is not, this is, this is an amazing study and I can't wait for the results. And I've talked about this with our mutual friend, Tommy Wood in the past. I mean, Matt Budoff is arguably preeminent in the world of CT coronary angiography. Uh, UCLA is, there's no more reputable center and you're using a state of the art CT scanner. So uh, in terms of design of the study, um, technologically and in terms of radiologic interpretation of these scans, uh, it, it's, it's essential. it's in my mind, it's, unarguably uh, rigorous, uh, and I'm excited for the results. And I think that it's a great study to see clearly, um, will we see progression, accelerated progression of atherosclerosis in people who are metabolically healthy and have a, quote, elevated LDL that has increased more than 50% with a dietary change. I just want to add to this conversation to give my um, recent lipid panel context and where I'm at more context. I, I am not carbohydrate dependent in my metabolism now, I don't believe. I would still be considered low carb, but I probably get 20 to 25% of my calories from carbohydrates. And I've discussed this on previous podcasts where I broke down my macros. We can link to one of those podcasts in the past, but I will probably get 150 plus grams of carbohydrates a day, maybe sometimes 200 grams of carbohydrates a day 
and I'm getting maybe 200 plus grams of protein and probably 150 to 170 grams of fat per day. So if you do the macros, what you come up with is about 20 to 25% of my calories are from carbohydrates. The majority are fat. And then the remaining part is protein. Protein is usually around 30%. So it usually is about 30, 20, 50, give or take for my macros. Technically, you could say that's low carb because anything less than 40% of your calories is low carb, but I'm not ketogenic. So it's important to note that I'm probably still doing some fat burning. And I just want to add one more thing to this, this discussion. We don't have to go too far down this rabbit hole if you don't want, Dave, but you can comment it if you want. I do want to get to discussions of familial hypercholesterolemia. I think this is a good segue. But I also think that there's a, an interesting amount of data regarding the, the actual fatty acids that are in the human diet and response of lipids. This has been talked about now with this homeoviscous model uh, of um, cellular membranes, which I, is hypothetical. It's a hypothesis. It's an ex experimental model. But I think it's also compelling. And it, it is something that I've seen in the past. And basically the summary of this model, which I think could easily coexist or is completely compatible, could exist in tandem with an energy model for LDL lipoproteins, is that the more saturated fat you eat, and the less monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fat you eat, the more your LDL goes up is basically what people see. And I've observed this anecdotally in my N of 1. When I was in medical school, um, my LDL was 126, 128 milligrams per deciliter. And I was eating more olive oil. I was eating more monounsaturated fat. And I was eating less saturated fat because I wasn't eating as much meat and I wasn't eating as much tallow. Now, if people have heard my story, they know that in medical school, I was fairly healthy, but I had eczema, which led to the whole carnivore diet, rabbit hole, et cetera, et cetera. But people have often looked at my lipids in the past and said, Paul, you have familial hypercholesterolemia. They've often said that disparagingly, but I can prove that I don't have familial hypercholesterolemia because my LDL has been 126 in the past. It's actually been closer to 100 in the past. And I know, at least in me, and again, this is just the end of one, there's a direct observational correlation between the amount of saturated fat and the amount of poly and monounsaturated fat in my body. And so the homeoviscous model hypothesis is that the membranes of our cells need to maintain a constant level of fluidity. And one of the ways your body can make those membranes more or less fluid is by inserting cholesterol molecules. Cholesterol is a steroid molecule different than an LDL, low density lipoprotein particle into the membranes. And so if you are eating more polyunsaturated fat, then your membranes become more fluid because polyunsaturated fats have a little kink in the tail because of these double bonds. If you're eating more saturated fat, and we know this in humans, this is fascinating to me, the way that our cell membranes change in response to the fatty acids in our diet. This is a whole rabbit hole that I'll go into more in the future, but it has implications for tanning and sun exposure and skin cancer and skincare products, all these things. But I think that what we know about humans is we cannot convert polyunsaturated fats to saturated fats like a cow can. So the amount of polyunsaturated fat that you eat is directly going to be correlated with the amount of polyunsaturated fat in your cell membrane. And the idea is that the body is going to shift the amount of LDL in the body, in the bloodstream, to keep those membranes at a certain amount of fluidity as well. So these, I think these stack on top of each other. And I just wanted to add that to the discussion. I'm sorry that I rambled there, Dave. No, not at all. Um, and actually, it's, it's something I'm extremely interested in. And it's not a competitor to the energy model. It's quite complementary. The A major component to the energy model that has really been expanded on more in the last couple of years, but for which hasn't made it into every presentation, but is extremely relevant. And I think I can geek out with you on this a little bit here. I think actually we may have talked about it a bit more from several months ago, there was a point in which we were kind of having more regular conversations uh, privately, uh, but it's it's in particular the uh, membrane dynamics and how it relates to uh, expansion and contraction, which I think is extremely relevant back to the energy model again, particularly for adipocytes. So adipocytes, unlike other cells, really do need to have a lot of elasticity, understandably, because you need to be able to expand and contract them in the aggregate. Now, when you're doing so, it's not like one of those cells will take on the full load and, you know, you're doing it one at a time. It's, again, all of them in, in the kind of a cascade uh, to the extent where they can accommodate that difference. But to grow a membrane, whether it's a monolayer or a bilayer, does require uh, more phospholipids and free cholesterol to expand and likewise requires shedding more phospholipids in free cholesterol to contract. You don't grow or uh, shrink something that has one of these layers 
without having the pieces that need to get inserted or pulled out in order to accommodate that change. And so with an adipocyte, it's that lipid droplet that you're you know, putting in more and more triglycerides and to some degree, some other uh, lipids that you're making use of as well. That, that in order to expand it, you're gonna need to add more. And to your point, you're absolutely right. Our body is not endogenously making uh, all of those phospholipids that are part of that bilayer a lot of it's coming direct from our diet. We're, we're packaging it in, we're sending it in, and a lot of those lipoproteins are taken up through a process known as endocytosis. Um, that and transcytosis. And, and endo means in, ingesting effectively. Uh, transcytosis means actually literally taking it from one end of the cell and transferring it over to another end of the cell, usually for another cell uh, adjacent to it to be able to make use of it, right? Okay, why is it doing this? Well, to accommodate these changes either to size in the case of adipocytes like I just mentioned now, or to straight up maintenance for other cells, which is where the uh, resistance training experiments are of special interest to me because I think if you work out a lot, especially if you do a lot of anaerobic exercise that requires a lot more muscle repair, muscle tissue repair and growth, you're gonna need more membrane. You're gonna need more membrane maintenance. And therefore, I believe that there's a greater degree of endocytosis for people who are like heavy weightlifters. And we see this with actually fat adapted weightlifting people, which I love. I love that that data seems to match up. You're familiar with the keto gains group, for example. Uh, that was one of the first things that I noticed when first getting into this was I was like, wait a sec, why do a lot of people in this group tend to not get to full lean mass hyperresponder levels of LDL? But I see in runner types or cyclists, you know, people who aren't doing as much resistance training, they do seem to see the higher levels of LDL. And I think that's because of that endocytosis. Well, so to get back to your, the point that you made that kicked us all off, how much do those membranes, how much are they able to just take on whatever fatty acids come in those phospholipids? Again, a phospholipid is a phosphate head with two uh, um, lip, uh, fatty acid legs. And those fatty acid legs can be saturated, they can be unsaturated. And saturated means that they're straight, right? And the, uh, the, the majority of the phospholipids that are being used in our bilayers are, are saturated, but some amount will have uh, unsaturated or even polyunsaturated and how they kind of come together gets impacted by that. So the permeability gets a little bit and the, the fluidity does change by those fatty acid legs on the phospholipids, right? So it's absolutely the case that the more that you incorporate fatty, um, uh, what do I wanna say, um, um, especially polyunsaturated fatty acid legs to those phospholipids of the membrane, the more that is going to impact its fluidity. And there's plenty of science that's behind this. So that degree of what you are, what you eat, really does play a role in this. Because don't get me wrong, I certainly, think, and I'm sure you would agree, we do need PUFAs. We do need omega-3s. We need there, There's a degree with which they're absolutely essential fatty acids to a threshold point. The question is, what do, you, what do you get when you get well beyond that threshold point, especially when you're reducing the level of saturated fat that's available? How much does that how literally impact your membrane composition at the other end of the spectrum? That's, a, that's an interesting question. And we know that consumption of polyunsaturated fatty acids lowers LDL, and this is essentially the crux, as I see it, the place that Western medicine has gone horribly, horribly wrong. And really, this is the point of having these conversations and why they're so valuable when you come on the podcast, because the Western medical establishment, as we discussed, clearly believes that in a geometric fashion, more LDL equals more atherosclerosis. And so they are sort of with blinders on, they myopically will recommend any intervention, food or otherwise, which lowers LDL. We may or may not have time to talk about statins in this podcast. Um, people can listen to the one I did previously with Malcolm Kendrick if you're interested in statins. But one thing we know very clearly in human physiology is that if you consume more polyunsaturated fatty acids, you will lower your LDL. The problem, as I've discussed in many uh, previous podcasts, is that there's very good evidence that when you do that, there are interventional trials in humans showing that when you replace saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat, you will lower your LDL. Your LDL will go down, but your oxidized LDL and your LP little a, which is a lipoprotein we haven't talked about, but it's a cousin of LDL, will go up. And those are potentially very bad metrics. And uh, there's a lot of 
cognitive dissonance there, I imagine, for the mainstream medical establishment, and no one ever talks about that. Uh, then I've heard them talk about polyunsaturated fatty acids. But if you go to your cardiologist and you tell them you are eating canola oil, they will pat you on the back and say, that's great because you can lower your LDL with canola oil. And I believe this is why. It has to do with membrane fluidity and probably induction of different proteins, um, steroid responsive binding element proteins in the liver, et cetera, uh, that change based on saturated fat versus polyunsaturated fat in the human diet. And if anyone is listening to this, I will be very clear about my position, which I've uh, ex uh, really discussed in detail many times in the past. And I do not believe that polyunsaturated fats and evolutionarily inappropriate amounts, as you hint at, Dave, are good for humans. In fact, I strongly suspect um, that this is at the root of most metabolic disease. And so I'll just add one more thing, and then I'll kick it back over to you, which is that though polyunsaturated fatty acids are quote-unquote essential, if you are eating a whole foods diet containing meat and organs, there is no way that you will ever become deficient in any polyunsaturated fat, even omega-3s, in my strong opinion. Uh, these ruminants have about 2% of their fat from linoleic acid, so there's plenty of linoleic acid for humans in ruminants. And if we look at hunter-gatherer groups, they demonstrate evolutionarily appropriate levels of linoleic acid specifically, which is an 18-carbon omega-6 fatty acid. Uh, I want to differentiate that from omega-3s, which is the topic of a different podcast. And they, they have plenty of this in their diet. They get about 2% of their calories from this fatty acid. That, I think, is evolutionarily consistent in contrast to westernized Americans who get 10 to 15 or 20% of our calories from linoleic acid. But the point that we're making here is that linoleic acid in your diet will change your LDL. It will lower it. And therein lies the main problem that I believe we're suffering from as Western uh, medical, medically inclined thinkers. Yeah, there, I mean, to be sure, there's, there, I have a problem trying to find where I believe the degree of lowering it, it, let me put it this way, and how much a high PUFA diet results in lowering of LDL is it, at what points have the greatest influence. And I feel like I'm just going to need more experiments that do it. So I'm aware of probably around six or seven different points of influence for where a PUFA can lower resulting LDL. Uh, and I'll try to go through a few of them off the top of my head. For one, for example, there is a uh, higher ketogenesis inducing effect of PUFAs. So there's more that gets shuttled towards the ketogenesis pathway. If, and, and if so, that would be in opposition of the triglyceride assembly and therefore VLDL secreting pathway and therefore succeeding LDL, if, that's, if that is one path. There's also a greater... Um, uh, Siobhan found this paper and we ended up looking it up in a couple other places, but that basically a greater degree of, uh, we'll call it manufactured bias. There's a, there's a higher problematic creation of lipoproteins in that they can sometimes get shuttled. And this happens in the ER, if I'm not mistaken, I, but I'd have to look that up. But basically there's more manufactured bias that happens in that case where there's less that's going to get secreted for that reason. But the one that I'm especially interested in is how much of those that do get secreted when the monolayer has more um, polyunsaturated fat is more susceptible to oxidation. In other words, the lipoprotein in entirely is more likely to get oxidized in circulation. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily good or bad, but I will say with a lot of confidence, it does mean it's gonna get removed sooner by scavenger receptors. That's literally what the scavenger receptors are waiting around for is if they, um, if they connect with more oxidized uh, LDL particles, they're gonna get removed from circulation sooner than the typical two to four day um, uh, persistence that you typically would see with an LDL particle, right? And then there's the uh, HADL model, which I'm not sure if that was the one you were talking about earlier, but the HADL model, I think came out last year or this year, but they were describing why it is that perhaps for the membrane fluidity, fluidity maintenance, that there's more uptake of lipoproteins in order to compensate for this uh, abundance of uh, PUFA. And actually of the models, that sounds the most concerning. Their model sounds the worst. In other words, your, your body's uh, creating a compensatory effect of having to take up more lipoproteins in order to fix an issue of there being too much of an abundance of a particular fatty acid, right? Um, so they, those are just the ones I could think. Oh, and I'm sorry, let me throw in one more, which is that there is a higher expression of LDL receptors with a greater degree of PUFA. 
that one I, I'd want to see a little bit more that would convince me of it, but that one, um, at the time that I was researching it wasn't as strong. I, I'd have to take another look at it again. The point is there's a big spectrum of different things for which PUFA can have an impact on your LDL. I agree. I don't agree that we have something that's got a very strong model of atherosclerosis, even in an animal model for which I'm able to see that the likewise degree of, of subtraction or, or reduction in LDL sees a likewise outcome in atherosclerotic uh, severity. Uh, that one I would be very interested if they could make so that we can actually see that outcome specifically. Yes. Can we talk a little bit about familial hypercholesterolemia? You mentioned this earlier. It's a stumbling point or it's a talking point, I should say, for many of the advocates of the response to retention hypothesis, which is essentially the mainstream paradigm for LDL geometrically causing atherosclerosis. They often point to people with familial hypercholesterolemia, and you and I have had some great discussions offline about problems with using FH, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, as a model for otherwise healthy, metabolically healthy individuals with quote unquote elevated LDL. So walk us through some of this and, and maybe I can pull up some of the articles that you and I have talked about. I'm specifically thinking about some of the, um, the case studies of people with heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia with very elevated LDL and no, uh, no cardiovascular disease by imaging at the age of 73. But talk us through this monogenic versus polygenic, FH, heterozygous, homozygous, and why these are not a good model system to be thinking about for quote unquote elevated LDL in connection with atherosclerosis. Well, and this is another reason why I'm glad I, I opened with the metabolism aspect, because I'm gonna come back to that in one second. It, the best way to start in discussing the lipid hypothesis, this hypothesis that the higher level of concentration of cholesterol and particularly, I would say the modern version being ApoB containing lipoproteins, that this higher concentration drives atherosclerosis, really has a lot of its genesis in the 70s with Brown and Goldstein. Brown and Goldstein, who would then go on to win the Nobel Prize for their work with the LDL receptor, uh, were looking at seminal patients who had homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. And in particular, there was a patient uh, that I refer to a lot in my recent talks, especially on the pitch for the lean mass hyperspondor study. This patient, it's, it's a heartbreaking story, but it's, it's about a one in a million chance somebody will get this. She had extremely high levels of total and LDL cholesterol. Her LDL cholesterol was around uh, 780, I think, something in the neighborhood. Uh, she developed xanthomas, which are cholesterol deposits on her extremities, like her knees, I think. Uh, you can sometimes see it on hands and uh, the ankles, things like that. And a, an angina, a, a stable angina at age three. And she had her first heart attack at age six, a myocardial infarction. So that became extremely compelling evidence from the perspective of the community that, wow, this is, this is in the words of, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, the words of Dr. Goldstein, this is an example of this little girl did not have hypertension. She did not have a lot of central uh, obesity. She did not have um, type A personality, things along those lines, anything that you would normally associate with a risk factor. She just had high LDL. Now, what I would posit very meekly, because again, these are Nobel Prize winning Scientist, I do have a lot of respect for them. I've learned a lot from them. What I will say very cautiously is there is kind of an assumption being made, which is that anything else that could have resulted in the higher LDL is sort of being presumed to rule out, right? In other words, we're assuming it's just those higher levels of ApoB containing lipoproteins and that that which resulted in the higher levels of ApoB containing lipoproteins, we can safely rule out. I would argue that it's premature even 50 years later, it's premature for us to be able to rule that out. And that's why I want to bring back metabolism. So there's a study that we should link in the show notes, but that uh, I was specifically looking for the more that I was looking at it from the metabolic aspect, which is I wondered how much immune cells rely on lipoproteins. Let me repeat that. Immune cells like macrophages which are nucleated uh, cells. So they also have a family of receptors, including LDL receptors. How much are they impacted by having these mutations like this girl with 
no homozygous FH, because the reason for the higher LDL were these mutated LDL receptors that had poor binding cap capability. They couldn't bind to LDL particles. Well, if what I was telling you is true, that cells are reliant on these lipoproteins and immune cells themselves can't connect to them. Does that impact their performance? Does that impact their capability to clear plaque, things along those lines? And I would, again, I'm not saying that I'm sure that they do. I am saying though, that we shouldn't be ruling it out until we can investigate it. And so there have been in vitro studies on macrophages cultured from lipoproteins. Oh, did you find it? You have this one in? Mm. Okay, yep. perfect, yeah. So these are, these are cultured um, macrophages from people who had heterozygous FH, and they found that indeed their uh, receptor binding capability was altered, and therefore they seem to almost have a compensatory up expression of other receptors because there are other redundancies. There are other receptors that can handle um, LDL particles, uh, that can handle modified LDL particles and so forth. There, there's a whole super family around it. But the point is they did operate differently. They do function differently. And I think that's a crucial piece of the puzzle that we have to have on the table to discuss and, and consider. Because yes, where I think you're going and where I'm gonna go is there are genetic diseases that do result in higher LDL, but do not impact lipid metabolism, including at a cellular level, including say macrophages and immune cells. My favorite example being glycogen storage disease. Glycogen storage disease became extremely uh, uh, relevant to me because, hey, what is it that I'm positing is going on with people on a low carb diet? Well, they have less glucose getting back to metabolism, right? Therefore, less glycogen stores. If you have less glycogen stores, your body detects that and then mobilizes more fatty acids to be fueled by. Well, what if your body has a disease where it thinks, oh, it's not even just that it thinks, it literally does have less glycogen stores, but therefore gets the signal over and over again to mobilize more fat. Well, that's glycogen storage disease. So they have higher triglycerides and they have higher ApoB containing lipoproteins, but you know what they don't have higher levels of? They don't have higher levels of atherosclerosis in spite of having the higher ApoB. And so there are now four studies that I found at least that were looking at glycogen storage disease. Yeah, 1A, for example. And it's not associated with premature atherosclerosis. And there's been a whole lot of study and they have yet to figure out exactly what it is that's different. But I'll tell you what I would posit. I would posit that what's different is that they're starting from the assumption that the ApoB containing lipoproteins should be causing atherosclerosis but the cells of their body can process them just fine. They can process ApoB containing lipoproteins and lipids just fine. If we, if we cut, Paul, if we just cut everybody in one category that has some abnormality with lipid metabolism out, and we just look at everybody who has a functional lipid metabolism, whether it be from diet or whether it be from a disease that changes LDL levels, but does not change their lipid metabolism, that category, that's what I'm interested in. That's what the study is about. Let's just see, let's see what the data looks like for those people who have high LDL, but otherwise functional, seemingly healthy and productive metabolisms. That's what we should be looking at. These are such important points, Dave. So just to go over this with familial hyperlipidemia one more time for people, there's heterozygous and homozygous, which depends on how many copies of a, of a mutation you have. We're talking about, there are over 2,000, maybe more than 2,000 different uh, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms that can result in familial hypercholesterolemia. Some of them are in the LDL receptor, some of them are not. But as, what, as Dave is pointing out, and Dave pointed this out to me originally, um, and as I showed on the YouTube video, and as we will link to in the show notes, there are multiple studies that suggest that in people, in many people who have familial hypercholesterolemia, but again, this is not a homogeneous group of genetics. This is a very heterogeneous group. And as I will show in a moment, not all people with quote unquote familial hypercholesterolemia develop premature atherosclerosis. But in many people with certain SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, that affect cholesterol metabolism, uh, their monocytes, their immune cells are not quote unquote normal. And as one of the studies we pointed to was macrophages, which is the, um, the downstream uh, immune uh, uh, cell that comes from a monocyte, macrophages of genetically characterized familial hypercholesterolemia patients show upregulation of LDL receptor-related proteins. Well, 
do we think that maybe if these immune cells that we know are critically involved in the formation of foam cells and taking up LDL particles, if they have more LDL receptors, are they more likely to take up LDL particles? Could that lead to accelerated atherosclerosis? Absolutely, but this is never discussed. It's just a myopic focus on the fact that these FH patients have elevated LDL. And so I think this is a really, really important point to make is that when you are looking at someone with familial hypercholesterolemia, and you see an elevated LDL, the question then has to be, which type of FH do they have, which is sometimes an unanswerable question because there are so many different types of genetics. And secondly, are other parts of their, as you've said so eloquently, Dave, metabolism, the metabolism at the level of their monocytes, macrophages aff affected negatively. And I believe there are also polymorphisms with FH that associate with hypercoagulability. So there are often co-occurring polymorphisms uh, or co-occurring me metabolic defects or metabolic changes that make these people more likely to get atherosclerosis, as we're pointing out. And I think this is why, like you're saying, the glycogen storage diseases are a fascinating counterpoint to say, okay, in a glycogen storage disease like GSD1A, which I believe, is that McArdle's disease? Um, that's just the eponym. Um, it, the, these people do have elevated LDL. Um, so they can have a uh, deficiency of microsomal glucose 6-phosphatase in the liver and kidney, which leads to GSD1A. And they do have, quote-unquote, elevated L LDL. But as I showed in that study, which is titled, Is Glycogen Storage Disease 1A Associated with Atherosclerosis? We'll link to that in the show notes as well. The finding of that study was no. There's no premature atherosclerosis in those patients with a, quote-unquote, elevated LDL possibly because their metabolic machinery is not broken. I also wanted to show this is just a case report. It's an, another N of one, but it's, it's a quite interesting case report, I think, to, to show. And this is a, a report, a 72-year-old patient with longstanding, untreated familial hypercholesterolemia. This patient is heterozygous, but no coronary artery calcification. And so this is to say that, again, not all FH is created equally. This patient had persistent elevations in their LDL greater than 310 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, Matt Budoff would certainly believe that these, this guy would have um, accelerated atherosclerosis, and yet you have a 72-year-old man who's imaged by, I believe, coronary artery um, calcification scanning, which is a type of CT scan. Uh, this paper was published a number of years ago, so it's probably not CT coronary angiography. Oh, this is from 2018. Uh, Multi-slice computed tomography or contrast-enhanced CT coronary angiography is what they did, um, or actually negative for any CAC in this patient with elevated LDL. So again, does this patient have, I wish we had a fasting insulin on this patient, which would make it a little bit more of a clear picture, but not all FH is created equally and familial hypercholesterolemia is often associated with other metabolic issues. Um, the other piece of this equation that I think is fascinating, maybe we can talk about this too, Dave. Have you seen the data on chimps and the mm -hmm. the antigenic structure of chimp versus human LDL? Yes, uh, but but kick it off because I, I you were telling me about this. I didn't actually know as much as you did because you researched a lot on this, I'm, and it's pretty fascinating stuff. I think I got this from I forget who sent me this stuff. So, um, but. There's two pieces of this equation that are fascinating. Um, the first is that uh, chimp, chimpanzee versus human LDL uh, is essentially indistinguishable. Uh, they're, they're essentially the same, and this, these have been characterized multiple times and found to be uh, about the same. Now, this makes a lot of sense because most people will know that humans are believed to have uh, evolutionarily descended from chimpanzees so and bonobos. Chimpanzee serum lipoproteins, isolation and characterization, and comparative aspects of the low-density lipoprotein and apolipoprotein BH. Um, and you will notice that um, the, the chimps have an LDL that is essentially indistinguishable. That's what they say here. The antigenic structures of chimpanzee and human LDL were essentially indistinguishable. <laughs> now, the, the kicker is that when you look at this, um, they say heart disease is common in humans and chimpanzees, but is caused by different pathological processes. And basically what you find is that in chimpanzees, they do not get atherosclerosis. They do not get this plaque formation in their arteries despite having uh, what would be considered, quote unquote, very elevated levels of LDL in the blood. I believe from the first paper, uh, they, they, have a, um, they have a significantly higher LDL. Uh, adult chimpanzees by analytical ultracentrifugation revealed a lower mean LDL level uh, 
269 milligrams per deciliter. So chimps have a much higher LDL than humans, but they do not develop atherosclerosis as heart disease. I think they have arrhythmias um, and other types of heart failure, which are different, but they do not develop atherosclerosis despite having, quote unquote, essentially the same LDL particle as humans, being our very close evolutionary cousins and having an LDL, which is in the, uh, the, the danger, red lights going off everywhere range for humans, according to every cardiologist in the world. Now, again, it's chimps versus humans, but it's quite interesting. Yeah, well, and it's, Sorry, did you say that they have the same particle count or they, they're LDL? The LDL, so, uh, go the, ahead. The LDL was measured at um, uh, 269 milligrams per deciliter was the lower mean. And, um, but did they measure the, the LDLP? Yeah, well, they measured the molecular size, the 22 angstrom, 220 okay. angstroms, which is tw 22 nanometers, which is essentially the same size as a human. Uh, yep. The, yeah. So, they didn't measure the LDLP, but if you know the molecular size and the uh, milligrams per deciliter, you can infer that it's essentially the same. Yeah, in which case, I mean, bear in mind, a two, what was it, 269 uh, yeah. LDLC would be in, inside of the top 1% for, say, the enhanced population, uh, human population. So absolute, I mean, unmistakably super crazy high levels of LDL um, for, and again, if we're talking different physiological processes, the, here's sort of the thing about the, the lipid hypothesis. I think the lipid hypothesis is interesting in that because it's simple, it's very testable. And that's, that's great in the sense that we can then start to look towards all aspects for which we can see that simple application. Now, as with any hypothesis or for that matter model, if there's a fairly uh, strong um, uh, detection of, of a population that seems to not be that the hypothesis or the model doesn't apply to, you need that to be fit into. There needs to be some explanation for how that applies. It's one thing to say, oh, we feel confident that smoking causes lung cancer, even if there's the one, you know, grandpa that um, lived to 90 having three packs a day. It's another to say, hey, I can find a population that has three packs a day and the majority of them do not develop, uh, or I should say, there's not the proportion of difference that we would expect for lung cancer, right? Okay, so can I pick an animal species for which there would be high LDL and not a likewise atherosclerosis, and it have something to do with the physiology of what they have? Sure, and it very well could be that that will fit into the lipid hypothesis once we better understand it, but do we think that's worth pursuit? 100% it's worth pursuit, right, to better understand. But here's where it gets interesting. Again, which model is going to make more sense to you and me is the, uh, is the metabolism aspect, a functional versus dysfunctional lipid metabolism. Is that making more things fall into place? For me, so far, it does. And let me give you another animal example, one of my favorites being bears. Bears, uh, especially I think it's brown bears, will hibernate for almost half of the year, right? And during that period of time, they've looked at both bears in captivity and in the wild they are hyperlipidemic. Their cholesterol goes through the roof, which of course I would expect per the energy model because they're now powered much more by fat, right? They literally are fattening up in order to then be able to go into a state of hibernation. Well, they've also, oh, good, you've got this, you've got this one available as well. So then, yes, I love how they further uh, did uh, aortic exams and found that they did not have rapid development of plaque. And Again, this seems to make sense from the perspective of their lipid metabolism was functioning as we would expect. There wasn't, there wasn't a better uh, explain their higher LDL. It was the opposite, that they were actually functionally using their lipids in order to survive properly. And that's probably a good thing. Doesn't seem to be matched with a likewise outcome of higher levels of plaque development. So again, I'm constantly landing in a model that to me makes more sense for which as long as you can both store and make use of fat, even if you're relying more on it, then the ApoB containing lipoproteins don't seem to have that likewise association with risk we would expect if we're taking the lipid hypothesis broadly. Now, I will say that some have pushed back on the bear model of LDL because and said that their ApoB has a few changed in functional domains, which doesn't allow it to bind to proteoglycans in quite the same way. Um, 
And we can talk about proteoglycans and why those are important. And that's actually a very interesting rabbit hole to go down briefly. But that for me, I think is, we don't know for sure, but it is an interesting, okay, that's reasonable. Like you're saying, when we're comparing species, we have to be very careful. That was one of the reasons the chimp data was so fascinating to me because the LDL is like indistinguishable from humans and ApoB is essentially indistinguishable. There's n you can't make the same argument in chimps as you could potentially theoretically in bears. Um, but again, the bears do have very very high levels of, um, of ApoB when they're hibernating and do not develop atherosclerosis. Now, if, if the ApoB molecules are functioning in the same way that they do, and there is some conservation of that physiology across species, which we might expect reasonably, then I think it is a function of ApoB to bind to proteoglycans. And I would suspect that, that the bear, if you did actual research, I bet that bear ApoB still binds to proteoglycans. Why is this important? Because there is a model of atherosclerosis which posits that part of the thing that's going on is that these LDL particles are becoming either endocytosed or pulled into the subentimal space, and they are binding to proteoglycans there. Now, I found it interesting as I was researching this. I think we've talked about this, but let me know how you feel about this idea, Dave, that the 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 essentially the subintimal space has these biglycans, these proteoglycans, and that LDL can kind of get stuck to those. And that interestingly, <coughs> what I found was that insulin resistance could induce higher amounts of proteoglycans in this subintimal space, essentially making the subintimal space more sticky. So there, there's a paper... Um, distribution of glycosaminoglycans in human aortas, changes in atherosclerosis and diabetes. So this is the, the hypothesis here would be that do these diabetic states, do these uh, insulin resistant states create the deposition of more proteoglycans mm -hmm. in the subintimal space, making LDL more likely to get stuck there? And if your LDL is more likely to get oxidized, this to me can starts to begin at least suggesting a hypothesis by which we could connect um, directly things like metabolic dysfunction and the progression of atherosclerosis. And I'll just say this as well, that um, it's quite interesting when you look at the eye, because I, I forget where I learned this, but um, there is a the bioglycan, this proteoglycan um, accumulates in multiple tissues, but LDL doesn't accumulate there, like tendons or the cornea. And the idea is that perhaps the cornea is avascular. So in the cornea of the eye, the aqueous humor, which is the fluid behind the cornea, is felt to have the exact same level as LDL of LDL as the serum. And it's separated from the cornea by one, uh, one cell layer called the decime epithelium. But the cornea doesn't get atherosclerosis because it doesn't have any vasculature. There's, the hypothesis would be because that LDL cannot move across that single cell layer, decimase epithelium, which is probably a good proxy for the endothelium of the inside of a blood vessel, those LDL particles that are in the aqueous humor behind the cornea cannot move into the cornea where there is proteoglycans and they could get bound because there is no vascularization. There are no blood vessels. There's nothing to move the LDL into that space. Are you familiar with kind of like what I'm driving at here? I think it's a really interesting sort of idea. Not, so not as much in that area with the, uh, with the, um, with just the, the space in the eye itself in, in that, uh, but here's the thing. You said a few things that I really do want to get back to, if you don't mind, if I pull it back a little ways, because yeah. one thing that you were talking about is something I'm very interested in, which is the density levels of the proteoglycan within different spaces. You would expect, you would expect wherever it's more dense, where there's higher concentrations of proteoglycans, you would get a likewise correspondingly higher level of atherosclerosis, right? Because now you're talking about a higher, greater concentration in both places. Well, what's fascinating about this is this actually kind of runs almost a little bit counter to the, since there's now more of an acknowledgement that there can be more of these lipoproteins coming around via transcytosis, which is more recent, literally within like the last year to year and a half. And this includes from the EAS group that brought us the low density lipoproteins cause atherosclerosis paper, the consensus paper from 2017. Their second paper was discussing uh, transcytosis being a major component to atherosclerosis. So again, there's a shift that needs to be discussed here. We're talking less about the crashing through and more of the controlled fashion of moving it through via transcytosis. That, by the way, is very relevant to me because that's what I've been positing for a very long time, that I believe it's part of a controlled process, or rather that I believe it's more likely 
part of a control process as to how those lipoproteins ended up in the subendothelial space, right? But here's where you and I may be different in that I don't start with the assumption that that's where things go wrong. And now, now the lipoproteins are stuck where they would have not been stuck and that it's entirely by accident and not by design. My first inclination is to still go with what appears to be a process of triaging where it, it, so much of the immune response has to do with containment in general, it has to do with slowing down pathogens and if anything, trying to hold them up to the point where eventually you can get, especially the macrophages involved. Macrophages are especially powerful, especially the M1s for being able to just endocytose all the bad guys, including some of the good guys and just kind of take them in and then uh, uh, acidify them and, and digest them and so on and so forth. This is why I sometimes refer to lipoproteins, especially ApoB-containing lipoproteins, as non-nucleated immune cells. I think that they may just be part of the sticky balls, if you will, that you're actually trying to place in the way of the pathogens to, to get them to get a hold of them in order to basically hold them down until you can get the macrophage coming. Again, I reemphasize this is all somewhat hypothetical, but makes much more sense to me. We're already looking at a site of inflammation then to start with the assumption that actually they're the initiators of the site of inflammation, that lit, that these ApoB-containing lipoproteins are actually ending up in the subendothelial space, ending up with, inside of proteoglycans, and then creating a positive feedback loop of perpetual atherosclerosis development. Because if that were true, then we would always see that in a likewise manner throughout the vasculature. We would see it everywhere. It would be all over the place. Rather, I go by what we already see and what's already in the literature with something known as hemostasis. Hemostasis became extremely important to me a couple years ago because on one end of the spectrum, uh, what, what did it, sorry, hemo is blood, stasis is control. And as you learn about it, and I think uh, Malcolm Kendrick also talks about this. So this is a place where we kind of overlap a lot. There's, there's the back and forth between fibrinogen, which is a protein that provides fibrin and plasminogen, which provides something that we're just gonna basically call as the anti-version of that. What fibrin is, is that they, they're called fibrin because they're kind of like fibers. They lay down the groundwork to help capture blood cells to create clots. And that's usually used when you're into secondary hemostasis, which is worse than uh, primary hemostasis. Primary hemostasis, you only need a platelet plug. There's some hole in, in the vasculature and a platelet plug does the job and you're fine. That's, that happens constantly and all the time in your vasculature. Secondary hemostasis is there's something bigger. It's a little more complex. So the immune response is to try to, with fibrin, capture it, tra trap it. Try it. That's where clotting becomes helpful. Try to actually get red blood cells and other things to basically stabilize the area. And if you can imagine a construction crew on you know, the side of the road trying to like uh, wall it off so that cars don't get caught up and tra trapped there, that's what it is. Secondary hemostasis can result in repair where, okay, now it's, now it's fixed, it's gone. Now somewhere, Paul, between primary and secondary hemostasis, and a full-blown atheroma and stenosis and all that bad stuff is this gray area, right? And in this gray area is something that's more complex that's going on that I think has lots of different character to it, lots of different ways in which things can go right or wrong, that it well could be lipoproteins are part of that process by design, that we have that we have receptors that are pulling them into it, that are triaging it into the subintimal space, that are trying to clear out and uh, work with uh, immune cells to accomplish getting everything cleared away and put away. And that it can go wrong, just like a hospital getting overwhelmed, there could be more hospital error, and then you can blame the hospital, or you can say, well, wait a sec, if there wasn't the catastrophe that put the hospital under stress, Maybe there wouldn't have been the problems with the hospital error. Let's not start by blaming the hospital, right? I know I'm kind of throwing a lot of analogies out, but hopefully I'm getting across this important point, which is I think, again, we should start with what's happening in a healthy lipid metabolism and one that's not already injured, one that doesn't already have existing injurious stress. Because before, until we can do that, I don't want to accept any possibility to say, oh, lipoproteins might get... Might be, might be getting stuck in proteoglycans under certain conditions. Okay, well, what about he healthy conditions? Let's see if it's happening under healthy conditions. And that's why I always kept coming back to this study. For, from four years ago, I was like, okay, well, you know what? Science has practically given us a gift in low carb resulting in this phenotype, if indeed it turns out 
that this phenotype is low risk because it could have only happened this way, Paul. We could have only ended up in a place where all that collinearity with all of these lipid levels changing actually went all the right way except for the one of interest, except for LDL being high. So if it is, if it is dose dependent, if it is that higher LDL particles will end up stuck in those proteoglycans at a concentration level, then lean mass hyperspondors should be showing us that signal right away, right? Well, and, but they won't have excess amounts of proteoglycans because they're metabolically healthy. So I think that these, these go hand in hand, right? So I think that what you're describing is an endothelial injury connected with quote-unquote inflammation. I think inflammation and insulin resistance, metabolic dysfunction, these all go hand in hand. We know there's endothelial dysfunction in hyperinsulinemia in metabolic dysfunction. And I think another part of that, that paradigm is that along with that, you could get more proteoglycans being laid down. But in somebody that's not metabolically dysfunctional, in somebody that is uh, more accurately metabolically healthy, they shouldn't have that like excess biglycan, the excess proteoglycans in the subintimal space. Does that make sense? But, but you have excess LDL particles, right? So if you're thinking of right. them as multipliers to each other, right, right. Then, then there should be, per the lipid hypothesis, modernly, like, you should have a, a higher degree. Think of it this way also. You could also say, you know what? I think any injury that occurs, which is going to happen throughout the vascular system all the time, especially where there's higher shear stress, like everyone agrees on that aspect of it, that it shouldn't repair if you've got a higher, I mean, relative, we're talking, we're not talking about like, you know, 10% more, 20% more. We're talking about a number of people who have LDL particle counts that are well into the 1% of the population. It should, per the lipid hypothesis, in comparing, going back to Brown and Goldstein, comparing, like I know personally now, around, I want to say 15 to 17 people who have an LDL comparable to that little girl, who have an LDL around 700. And I, and I emphasize to all of them, look, this is, this is uncharted territory. And so you know, these are the things that they observe with homozygous FH. Be aware of this. It could be very concerning, right? And, and don't take too much comfort in any of this. You know, work with your doctor, et cetera. That said, I do want them to report anything that they've observed that's comparable to what we've seen from Brown and Goldstein. Thus far, we've not seen much matching. Again, could just be a slower progression. I, again, I want to be a good scientist as much as possible, and I don't want to be blasé about it. But it is relevant if it does turn out to be true that the lipid metabolism aspect of this equation really was the stronger model. Uh, and it, that's not even saying they're mutually exclusive. But if it is the stronger model, it could be very meaningful. This could be a very important time for us. I have not heard of xanthomas or xanthelasmas in lean mass hyperresponders who do not have FH. Have you? Uh, no, I have. Uh, I, so our so our lean mass hyperresponder group is around seven thousand. Uh -huh. um, actually, maybe closer to eight thousand now. And I want to say that there's been at least. I'm, I'm just going to ballpark. I think something in the neighborhood of around a dozen cases oh. for where it looks as if there's xanthalasmas, right? Mm -hmm. Part of the challenge with xanthalasmas, though, is that they occur already at somewhere in the neighborhood of around 1 in 200, 1 in 300 in the population. And there are there's a wide spectrum of possible things that can result in xanthalasmas, right? Um, and in some cases, people, like we're getting it before the diet, some people have actually left keto and then got xanthalasmas after leaving keto, so it's hard to know how much this matches up with the existing population average. But xanthomas that are not xanthalasmas have a much smaller number of possibilities as to what results in it. With xanthalasmas, there are things, for example, while it does sometimes get brought up with cholesterol, there are a lot of other things. It happens more often with females, for example. It has, happens more often with a number of other aspects that you'd have to go to the page for. But for xanthomas like tendon xanthomas or eruptive xanthomas that might show up in your hands, or in the back of your ankles. I'm very interested in those. And I've started many threads in the Facebook groups to say, hey, I'm looking for this. If anybody is seeing this, we, we should be talking about it. You can reach out to me publicly or privately. It's very important because it, it is extraordinarily associated with uh, high cholesterol for people who have monogenetic FH. We haven't yet talked about monogenetic versus polygenetic, but monogenetic FH typically it has a high association with these levels of xanthomas that are not xanthalasmas, that are, you know, typically on, on tendons and, and knees and all kinds of places. So if you haven't seen xanthomas, let's just differentiate. This is confusing. I had to look it up myself. Xanthalasmas are things that occur around the eyes. And right. xanthomas are tendon sheath 
sort of deposition. They're both sort of fatty depositions, but as you said, xanthalasmas are not always associated with uh, hyperlipidemia. And some people in the group actually had these before they did keto and presumably before they had elevated uh, lipoproteins. But xanthomas probably are more pathonomic of something like familial hyperlipidemia. Do you see xanthomas? Have you seen any xanthomas, tendon xanthomas? Not yet, but I, I'm cautious about even saying that because I do not want anyone to take my saying not yet as discouragement of bringing it forward. If you're listening to this now and you, even if you're optimistic about having high LDL, um, you know, while being on a low carb diet and you feel, you know, some sense of embarrassment or anything along those lines about having developed xanthoma, please either bring it to me or for that matter, bring it to my colleague, uh, Spencer Nadowski, who's cautiously pessimistic about the development of, um, of atherosclerosis and lean mass hypersome. And my point is, is that we all have to be good scientists, though you and I are making uh, a, a case as to why it is this other stuff should be considered. I have to reemphasize as many times as I possibly can that I don't know for sure that my expression of cautious optimism is an acknowledgement of uncertainty and that this is why I'm looking so hard for those things that do associate with monogenetic FH like xanthomas, because that could be a sign of something um, that could be much more concerning and I'd want people to look at it. Now, all of that said, I gotta say one more thing, which is that we have had a whole bunch of false positives. There are a lot of people who thought that they might have xanthoma as always, I say, work with your doctor and preferably in this case, uh, seek out a dermatologist. Because uh, the one thing I have learned is that there are a lot of things that um, are bumps and so on and so forth that turn out to not be xanthomas. There's, there's a ridiculous variety of kinds of uh, skin tags and things that uh, dermatologists know about that I don't, um, that it's turned out to be thus far. And I should mention that um... In this podcast, I'm drawing from some of the material that I prepared for a debate, a friendly debate with Spencer, who's been who's been kind enough to agree to that in the past. We'll still do it soon, Spencer. We I think we got waylaid by uh, Africa trip with the Hadza, um, probably COVID, and my trip to Costa Rica. So Spencer, can I just vote for that debate? I'd love to see that debate with the two. Oh yeah, yeah, we'll make we'll make it happen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll try and make it happen, Spencer. I promise. Um, as we wrap up, Dave, I want to talk about some of the studies that I think are very compelling and maybe start with this one, which is perhaps the best one. Let me pull it up for you here. Um, where is it? You had sent me this one. So Dave has mentioned the word triad in this um, study, in this podcast, and there's a pretty cool study. There are actually some studies done with people who display this phenotype, low triglycerides, high high density uh, lipoprotein cholesterol, and risk of ischemic heart disease. Um, Dave, walk me through it. Uh, yeah, so of course there, we have limited data, and I'm very upfront about that, on the triad where we're looking specifically at high HDL and low triglycerides. So we, we have lots of studies for which they look at its counterpart, the opposite of low HDL and high triglycerides, and that even has a name, it's called atherogenic dyslipidemia, named atherogenic dyslipidemia because it has such a high association with atherosclerosis. So if we look at the opposite, if we look at high HDL and low triglycerides and its association with atherosclerosis, do we find a high rate of uh, heart disease, particularly ischemic heart disease as they look at it here? No, we don't. We, we actually find that even when differentiating between a low and a high LDL group, and I think the one you're pointing to is the one that uh, separated by 170 milligrams per deciliter of LDL, which is yes, like high, as a median. really high, right? That actually the differences are hardly existent at all between the two uh, separate triads, the, the high HDL, low triglycerides versus the um, low HDL, high triglycerides. To which, once again, it's, it's to me, it's crazy to look at, I've said this on your podcast many times before. I'm just going to say it one more time. I think it's just crazy to look at a single lipid marker and then determine so much of lifelong therapy from it, right? I mean, again, you know, I don't, I, this isn't medical advice. I don't want to be a doctor, et cetera, but gosh, why, if we know these lipid profiles have so much impact when looked at together, looking at these multi-compositional uh, aspects, why wouldn't we not only look at that? Why wouldn't we do more research where we break them out 
and we differentiate and stratify and then look at what their outcome levels are. Uh, it's, it's frustrating to me. I want to, the Citizen Science Foundation, while we're mainly focused on lean mass hyperresponder study, one of the things I would love for it to eventually do is to just commission some more retrospectives on these other data sets like uh, Copenhagen, like UK Biobank, like Framingham, that are longitudinal and track the triad over time. It doesn't have to be a low carb diet, just other people who had high LDL alongside high HDL and low triglycerides and see over the course of their life, see how much it does or does not track with all cause mortality. And again, I'm very upfront and very open that I think it's gonna, it's gonna track with lower uh, all cause mortality. But to that study you just brought up, I likewise think it's gonna associate with lower cardiovascular disease. Now, I'm, I'm just remembering that I had this other study pulled up, and I don't want to end the podcast without showing it because it's such a good illustration of one of the questions that we were suggesting earlier. And the title of this one is, Hyperlipidemia Does Not Impair Vascular Endothelial Function in Glycogen Storage Disease Type 1A. So Dave and I had talked about this article specifically. Well, we talked about this concept earlier in the podcast and asked if there was an experiment in humans, and I'd forgotten about this paper. So the, the question that we are asking, or one of the corollary questions we are asking is, is LDL directly injurious to the vascular endothelium? And in glycogen storage disease 1A, as we talked about, there is no increased incidence of premature atherosclerosis. And here's a great study showing that hyperlipidemia in glycogen storage disease 1A does not impair vascular endothelial function. Uh, I'm not sure how someone is going to make an argument that LDL is directly injurious to the endothelium with data like this in existence. And I'm not sure how you can make an argument that the response to retention hypothesis is complete or should be the prevailing paradigm for atherosclerosis or that LDL geometrically increases your risk for atherosclerosis as you increase your level of LDL when data like this exists. Um, I just wanted to throw this one out, Dave. Any comments on this again? No, this is new, right? I don't think I've seen this title before, um, but I'll have to check it out. It, it looks, is this 2021? Because down in the bottom right-hand corner, it looks like, unless it's... Uh, just on a different citation. Oh no, that's because it's, um, that's a tab, I think, from something you downloaded that was 2021. Yeah, this uh, is September 30th, 1994. Oh, 94, gotcha, yes. Okay, then I probably have seen that one. But but correct, let's, let's get to the crux of what you're talking about because it's what I mentioned from a little bit earlier. Can I identify a group of people? Not the one guy, right? Not the, not the 90 year old uncle who smokes three packs a day. Can I point to a group? A, a, group of people for which I can say, hey, this group of people should be able to test between these two models. Because it is a place where there's a conflict between the model of lipid metabolism versus that of the lipid hypothesis, right? If, if their lipid metabolism, and again, it's open-ended, it's testable for diseases I haven't thought of yet, or that you haven't thought of yet, that would have functional lipid metabolisms, but would have likewise a high level of LDL. In glycogen storage disease, that's I've never once found an example of a group of people for which we're seeing a likewise increase of atherosclerosis. And yeah, so therefore I'm inclined to say that I don't think it has that independently injurious uh, aspect that can lead to it. Uh, but with with an understandable caveat that these are typically case reports, it is hard. It's it is a rare disease in order to find, especially one A but not so rare that we don't have a number of examples to be able to fill up as many case reports as we do. And again, getting back to these larger scale uh, data sets, it's now easier to find people who have genetic abnormalities than it was before. You didn't have to recruit them. You can actually go and look in the data to find it uh, itself. I look forward to the point where we can really test this a little bit more robustly. Me too. <laughs> Me too, Dave. Um, okay, awesome. So I think that we've given people a a great run through LDL and all of these uh, ideas. Let's just wrap it up for people and help them understand. So let's go back to the beginning of the podcast where we have somebody on either an animal-based diet or a lower carbohydrate diet who has a, an LDL that is rising and they go to their physician. What should that person be sure to ask their physician? Um, and what sort of a context, this is not meant to be medical advice, but <clears throat> What sort of a context or framing should they have with regard to that LDL as they are walking into their doctor's office with shaky fingers and sweaty palms, um, thinking they may get a pharmaceutical prescribed to them? 
Well, I, I'm always going to give the same general advice, which is, you know, do work with your doctor, do discuss this with your family, and then, you know, do your own research. I think, I don't think anybody could argue with me on this simple tenet, which is um, you, for any, any large decision in life, particularly one that involves your health and particularly one that requires lifelong uh, therapy, you should put in the effort to best understand what's going on for yourself and to make your own independent decision. Uh, as always, I support wherever somebody decides their comfort level is for themselves and their family. Um, again, while I may say that I am cautiously optimistic, I do know many people, including people in my family who are much less so and have taken steps to lower their LDL and I support whatever somebody wants to do individually. Now, for what it's worth, for me, for me personally, what I will consider to be the most important of all is actual physical measurements. That's why I like a CT angiogram. I, I'm actually gonna look to see if I can observe the disease itself. CT angiogram is kind of the gold standard in, and it does have you know, a radiation dosage that's associated with it, although it's lower than it's ever been. The last one I got was two millisieverts, which is I wanna say around two thirds of what a free living year would be, right? But physical oh. measurements, including a CAC, and including a CIMT, I'm always going to consider to be the most powerful um, data. Physical measurements is, you know, you're literally looking as best as you can at the disease itself. Second to that, the second layer to that are inflammatory markers. I think if you have chronic, chronically increased inflammatory, inflammatory markers, that I consider to be much more uh, associated with disease outcomes and particularly atherosclerosis. It is an inflammatory disease. And then there's blood markers. I think blood markers, including triglycerides and HDL, um, I'm going to put higher than LDL for me personally. But th those layers, I think, are relevant when I'm going to my doctor. Because when I'm going to my doctor, there may be a lot of things that I think are transient. You know, maybe I'm stressed out and I'm, uh, my, my levels aren't that great because of just before I took the blood work because I'm helping to run this crazy, huge perspective uh, trial, <laughs> right? Things like that. Um, but physical measurements, I'm always going to consider to be the most important for me personally. And maybe other people who are watching right now might uh, consider that themselves. So I would add to that. I think that you hit on a lot of these points. I think that if you go to your doctor with the blood work, make sure that your doctor is thinking about your metabolic health. Make sure that your not doctor is not just myopically focused on your LDL. Look at HDL. Look at triglycerides. Get an NMR panel. Look at small dense LDL. Even better yet, something we talked about on the last podcast that hasn't come up on this one, get a panel from Boston Heart looking at oxidized phospholipids on ApoB or, yeah, and get an HSCRP, get a fasting insulin, get a fasting insulin. You must know the context in which these lipids occur. It's not to say that it couldn't happen that someone could have the triad, high LDL high HDL, low triglycerides, and be metabolically unhealthy. I think it would be very rare because you're much more likely to develop metabolic dyslipidemia, which is a different phenotype with low HDL and high triglycerides. But um, you cannot assume that you are metabolically healthy until you prove that. You can prove that by doing a continuous glucose monitor like you guys heard about last week on the podcast. You can do that with a fasting insulin. You can do that looking at a visceral adipose tissue. So talk about imaging. You could get a, you could get a DEXA scan, looking at your visceral adipose tissue, which would be another good thing to do. I do think imaging your coronaries is great. A lot of physicians are hesitant to do that, but guess what? Um, you can pay for it out of pocket. They're less than $200 for a CAC scan, and you should be able to find a physician. I believe health should be democratized. And if a patient comes to a doctor and says, hey, I want a CT coronary angiogram, the doctor should say, okay, here are the risks and the benefits. The risks are that it's a small amount of radiation. Two millisieverts, like you said, is uh, around the level that you're going to get in a year of living on the planet. Um, it's pretty darn low. Um, and the benefits are that it'll tell us how much calcified plaque is in your arteries. So I don't think physicians should withhold those type of tests from patients for insurance reasons or otherwise. If your physician is doing that, I kind of look uh, askew. I look askance at them and I think, hmm, I'm not so sure about that. But that's the way I would frame it for people. I want to show your website here, um, uh, Dave, where people can check out the Citizen Science Foundation because I think this is a really cool thing that you're doing. And um, once we jump off the call, I'm going to ask you more about, um, oh, let me see how to do this. Hold on one sec. I'm going to ask you more about this nonprofit because I'm building a nonprofit to study animal-based diets, and I'm going to use your experience with the Citizen Science Foundation as a model. Um, but um, let's, you guys can go to 
citizenscienceFoundation.org. Here is the website for those who are watching on um, a video platform. And you can see here on August 27th, the lean mass hyperresponder study launched, as we <laughs> talked about. It's exciting. That was two months ago. It feels like three years ago. <laughs> I, yeah, right? In that span of time, it's crazy. Where can um, people find more of your work, Dave, or support what you're doing? Sure. Well, of course, there's uh, also cholesterolcode.com. That's our, our central site. Um, they they can always get blood, blood work through us, uh, own your labs. Part of why we formed that, though, is so uh, people were also incentivized to submit their anonymized data because we want to make an open data archive, also supporting citizen science. And, of course, I'm very active on Twitter, Dave Keto, at Dave Keto. And I'm trying, I'm trying to get a little more active on Instagram. Paul, I'm slow getting <laughs> Don't up there. Don't even bother. Be horrible. Horrible, but I'll get there eventually. <laughs> Instagram's horrible. You're not missing anything. Dave, what are you eating these days? What's your diet like these days? Uh, well, it's, uh, I'm trying, I'm actually trying to get beef more into my diet. I haven't been the best because I'm also going to an office lately, but I, I will say this, I've been able, I've been eating a lot of, I forget what the brand is, but they're pork rinds that are kind of flavor there you can just get them out of a package they're nice and crunchy and delicious and they're they're very low carb um the, how much linoleic acid is in them dave how much linoleic probably, acid probably is probably too much okay but we'll talk about I, that offline i also have a lot of i also have a lot of eggs and um uh again not bragging at all because the the diet hasn't been that fantastic is occasionally when i'm eating out with colleagues uh they like to go to marco's pizza and so i get the pizza bowls which is great that they offer that Mm, I don't know that it's, you know, top-notch ingredients. So I really do need to get back to health here pretty soon. So you did catch me at a time where I'm not proud of the things that I could say that I've been eating, even if I've been still relatively pretty low carb. Are you getting any organs? I'm going to send you some hardened soil supplements, my friend. No, you know what, though? I will I may take you up on that. Although I prefer to get it from real food, I do. I think I would I'd go for it. I think I'd go for the supplements right now. And I might even do some comparative blood work to see uh, what it may or may not change. It could be interesting. Yeah, I prefer people to get it from real food, too. And for those who are traveling or busy or just can't get the organs, that's why we do it at Hardened Soil. So, that is all me right. right now. Yeah, yeah, I see that, Dave. I see that. I hope we get to have a steak in person, man. Thanks for coming back on the podcast. For sure. Thanks for having me, Paul.